level a little bit, a little higher than I want. Okay, let's get that. Eh. Don't pay me, Mr. Camera. Hi, people. <laughs> I've got a whole new screening setup that I'm doing now, so oh, I'm taking me a minute to get everything adjusted right. Okay, now you can actually, like, see me and look at me. Um, the sunglasses will come off and on, uh, some of you may know, my regular glasses um, broke, and I have terrible, terrible eyesight, so the only thing I have left are my prescription sunglasses, so I have to wear them all the time, if I want to see the screen anyway. Ah, welcome, welcome, welcome. So, um, the main point of this stream is to talk about dealing with depression during the pandemic. Um, but there was some uh, <laughs> crazy stuff that happened here in like the last hour uh, at my house that um, I want to tell you guys about. So my husband woke up. He's a night shifter at a psych hospital here in Vermont. And he woke up sick. Um, he hasn't been feeling great for the last couple of days. He thought it was just allergies. Um, but he, you know, he didn't really have any heavy symptoms. But he woke up today actually coughing, runny nose, losing his voice, body ache, the whole deal. So obviously, um, he calls work to let them know, and he called the doctor's office. So to start this wonderful fiasco, his work, the person he called, basically told him that they're going to write him up because they want people to call out two hours before their shift starts. However, there is a clause in that that states that if you have a good reason why you weren't able to, such as hey, my alarm hadn't gone off yet, and I didn't know I was sick until I woke up. Um, the problem is that the union is off right now. They're not considered essential workers, so they're probably going to get away with giving him a write-up, and it's probably going to sit in his file for quite, quite a while until we are able to get it disputed and get rid of it. So there's that. And then the testing fiasco that just happened. I would not believe what just happened if I was not sitting here looking at it. So the doctor's office calls my husband back. Um, he had him on speakerphone. We were talking to them about symptoms. The doctor ordered the test. Um, there is pretty much in the whole northern half of Vermont, there's only one drive through testing facility, um, and that's over in Burlington. Uh, technically, I think it's Colchester, but we'll just call it Burlington. Um, so the doctor said, hey, I want you to get in the vehicle, start heading over there now. I'm going to call them, get the tests ordered, and they'll be ready for you when you get there. Not probably two minutes after that phone call, um, the testing place called my husband. First of all, the woman was nasty. She was not nice at all. Second of all, she tells him apparently that, well, we're closed for the day, and more importantly, uh, you live in a different county. You're not allowed to cross county lines. So you're going to have to go to the close, closest testing facility. And we're like, you are the closest testing facility. And she's like, no, we're not. And he's like, y then where is? And she's like, well, I don't know. But you're not allowed to cross the, the county lines. It was absolutely mind boggling. I have absolutely. So. <laughs> She actually told him, she told that she was going to call the doctor and basically like bitch out the doctor for writing the order for the test, for the drive-through facility. So my husband gets off the phone with her. The doctor calls us back and <laughs> the doctor's got no clue. He's like, I don't know what's going on. I guess apparently you're supposed to go to Central Vermont Hospital, but they don't have a drive-through testing facility there. So if he has to go there for testing, he's going to have to go into the ER, which that's the entire point of drive-through testing is because it's dangerous to send people that are potentially infected or potentially not infected into an emergency room. You could either be risking infecting people in the ER, or if you're not infected, you can be risking getting infected when you go to the ER. So we asked the doctor how this is going to work, what we're supposed to do. Doctor had no answers. None. He says, well, 
we're going to have somebody call you in the morning to figure this out. I'm sorry, figure it out? We're in the middle of a pandemic. It's been months. Like, what do you mean you don't know where people are supposed to go for testing? What do you mean you don't know if you're actually not allowed to cross county lines or not? Like, none of us has heard that. None, nobody's been told that if you're sick, you're not allowed to go to your doctor's office if it's in another county. Like, nobody, that hasn't been on the news. That hasn't been anywhere. So the manager for the drive through testing site, the only drive through testing site in northern Vermont, was incredibly nasty and just told told us that no she wasn't going to accept the doctor's order for the testing because technically we we live on the other side of the county line but we have no other place to go so that just happened by the way my husband works for the state of vermont as a psych tech in the vermont state psychiatric hospital let's just get that clear that's the treatment that my husband who is a medical worker just received he's gonna get written up and we have no idea where or how he's going to go get his testing and on top of it just the fun part is he's sick so yeah that just happened okay <sighs> let's get into the point <laughs> the original point of this stream. Um, I suffer from major depressive disorder and I'd been doing pretty well um, for several months, uh, even through all the stuff that's going on. Um, I'm so used to not being allowed to say in my videos the words coronavirus or COVID-19 that now that I'm in the live stream, I'm having trouble getting into the habit of actually just being able to speak freely about it which that in and of itself is a whole problem. That's, that's another whole problem for another topic in another video. Um, so over the course of the last week, my depression is flaring up really badly and I'm really, really trying to just slog through it um, to keep pushing. But each day it's like, you've got a weight tied onto you and it just gets harder and harder to move. Um, people that have never had clinical depression, um, they can often make the mistake of thinking that depression is just being sad. Um, but that's not really what it is. There's like a whole thing of psychological and physical symptoms that go along with it. It's kind of hard to put into words. It's like this feeling you're sitting there, right? And you have these things you need to do. And inside your own head, you're sitting there going, just get up just move, just go do it. But your depression doesn't let you do that. Um, your depression is another voice that's in there that says, just don't move. If you don't move, maybe it'll all go away. And it can get really debilitating. And I mean debilitating. Um, I've had periods of time uh, when my depression has been really flared up in the past where I literally it would take me hours just to be able to get out of bed, just to be able to get up and just go find food. Like there were times that I, I would be stuck in bed for days and I didn't get up to eat or anything. Um, especially now with, there's so many quote unquote, I would guess say external real world things that would make anybody depressed. Um, it's something that we have to be really, really careful with, and it's something I'm very acutely aware of. I've been working on various projects that involve coronavirus, COVID-19, whatever you prefer to call it, um, since late January. I'm well aware that we've lost people who suffer from psychological conditions. Um, we've lost them to suicide with this. One of them that uh, it broke my heart. I found out a couple of days ago, he was a favorite YouTuber of mine, um, Steve Cash. He had for years and years and years, this absolutely wonderful channel and series called The Talking Kitty Cat. Um, I watched every episode religiously. And a week ago, um, apparently he took his own life. His depression flared up and then with all the rest of the real world pressures on top of it, he didn't make it. 
and he's not alone. Um, we had a doctor in New York City at one of the hospitals. Um, I don't know if she previously had a diagnosis of depression or not, but she um, she she committed suicide as well. Uh, there have been a ton of reports just in the last couple of days in Russia. Um, several doctors have been throwing themselves out of uh, several story high windows at their hospitals. Um, so it's not anything to mess around with. It's not something you want to play with. Um, now me personally, how I am trying to handle this particular unique circumstance along with my um, depression, I, I realized today that I was in trouble. Um, I was definitely in trouble. I made myself get up. I made it to the computer. And I couldn't even manage to open my email. Um, there was just this, for me, with my depressive disorder, there's a lot of anxiety that gets tied into it. And my PTSD from long-term abuse also ties in with it. And I get this tremendous anxiety where contact with other human beings becomes like the worst thing that could happen. Like I'm terrified. I can't pick up a phone. I can't open the mail. I can't check my email. It's absolutely debilitating. And I felt that rise up in me. And I went, okay, no you're going to get into some trouble here. So I went on Twitter um, and I just did the simplest thing I could think of. And that was to just tell somebody, just tell, tell my followers, just say, Hey, I have depression. I'm in trouble. Um, and many people uh, responded and other people that have got um, problems with depression as well responded. And that helped. Um, it did definitely help. I, I've come to understand that depression thrives in silence. It, it really, it makes you think you're alone. It makes you think you have to stay alone. And the pandemic and the lockdowns are exacerbating that problem because we're physically, and in some cases for our own health, we actually are having to be alone. We're having to stay in, we're having to avoid um, going to see our friends and our family, especially our friends and family that are in high risk groups. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't go visit my mother right now for anything. She's in her 70s. She's got an autoimmune disorder. You know, so that little voice that usually is lying to you with depression that tells you you're all alone. Well, unfortunately, right now, we have an entire world telling us, no, in fact, you are stuck. You are all alone. And so what I did is I just reached out. I just reached out and said, okay, you can do this. You can write one tweet. And I wrote it, people responded and something kind of broke loose. I was able to respond back. I was able to get moving. I was able to start uh, going forward. And so I'm now kind of trying to create a plan for myself and I wanted to be able to share it with other people on what I can do to help manage my depression in this situation. And I think one of the best things to do is a catch it early um if you start feeling like you are losing control if you start feeling like uh, your depression is really raising its head even if you've never been diagnosed with depression um, you need to know what the symptoms are it's not just feeling sad and oftentimes you don't even emotionally feel sad you more feel just numb um it's kind of a myth that depression automatically means you're sad it's a lack of motivation it's an increase in anxiety it is a loss of interest in the things that you love to do. There can be physical symptoms um, of body aches, muscle aches. Um, there's some studies that have tied in fibromyalgia, which is a nervous system disorder, which I also have, um, makes your skin burn even to the touch. There are some things that have tied that in with clinical depression as well. So when you're depressed, you can physically hurt. Um, but for me, my big red flag my flag that says, okay, we, we're in trouble is when I don't want to contact other people, when I don't want to talk, when I'm thinking, when I'm getting that feeling like the phone rings and I'm like, I can't answer that phone. Or I get up and I'm looking at my notification that says I have emails and I'm sitting there right. No, I can't open those emails. That's for me. That's my, uh Oh, you have to, we have to do something right now. Obviously, I'm still taking my medication. Um, 
I am aware though that for some people in some parts of the world and even in the country, there are shortages. There have been um, a few instances of people not able to get their medications, which really, this is the worst time to have uh, psychiatric medication shortages. Um, I've been really lucky. I have a wonderful doctor. She has made sure that I have a little bit of extra. I've got like two weeks extra um, to try and tide me over if there's a shortage till when the next shipments come in or whatever. But so far that hasn't been an issue for me. Um, so obviously, you know, keep taking your medication, but that's not always enough. So one of the things you can do when you realize you're in trouble is make a small goal for yourself. It has to be really small. It has to be something that is really easy to do um, because your depression tells you you can't do anything and it tells you that you can't move. So if you're trying to motivate yourself to do this big, huge thing, um, it can be very easy for your depression to keep you from doing anything. So what, like I said, what I chose to do was to make a tweet. I said to myself, okay, just one tweet. That's all you have to do. And it, it kind of broke through It let me kind of break through. And that led to another thing I was able to do and another thing I was able to do, which led me here to this live stream. Um, I had several people ask me if I wanted to talk. And at the moment, I couldn't figure out what to say. For me, I love making videos. I like being on live stream. I enjoy interacting with people online. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, hello. We have a new subscriber. Let me put my glasses on. I haven't looked at the screen for a minute. I kind of got... <laughs> Tied up. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Pathfinder and Vincenzo. See, oh, I'm sorry if I butchered your name. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Keep it together and I'm okay. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's um what I have to just kind of keep keep saying. Oh, new subscriber. We have uh Michelle Kurth. Thank you so much for joining us. I really, really appreciate it. So yeah, uh, what I decided to do was just set up, I have a new laptop, um, a camera that I was able to get through some of my Patreon supporters um, about a month and a half ago. And I said, okay, set up a live stream and just talk. Because if you're in trouble right now, there's other people that are in trouble right now. Um, and for me, that has always been a big motivator. One of the things that I personally love to do, one of the things that's a huge passion for me is reaching out to other people and I like to help people. Um, it's what I've always liked to do. And being in front of a camera for me is not nerve wracking. I'm a singer and a songwriter and I was on stages by the time I was three years old. So I don't get nervous um, speaking publicly. So I said, okay, once I broke through the original wall um, with Twitter and I interacted with some people and I said, okay, now would be a good time to do a live stream about depression and dealing with it in the pandemic because it's easier, at least for me, to describe the situation when I'm kind of sitting in the middle of it. I want people to know they're not alone. I want people to know that there's other people going through it, there's other people struggling with it, and I think that it's important to put that face forward. There's been a lot of PSAs and there's a lot of ads made about the risks of depression and all of us coming together via the internet and whatever, and those are really important and they're great, but I sometimes feel like they can be a little tone deaf um, when it comes to depression, when it comes to speaking to people that have depression. They use all these bright, shiny little colors and they give you those platitudes that most people who have depression have heard their whole lives of just be positive and, you know, talk to somebody if you need help. And it's not that those aren't important pieces of advice. It's just that they miss kind of a big chunk of what depression is. Um, a lot of us, you know, who are depressed and we talk to each other, we'll kind of laugh about it a little bit, sitting there saying, you know, oh, well, gee, just be happy. Why didn't I think of that? You know, because <laughs> um, it's not that easy. So make goals for yourself, small, little tiny goals. Say, I'm going to get up and I'm going to get, I'm going to put on clothes that I really like to wear. Um, or I'm going to get up and I'm going to go take a shower. Um, keep it small, keep it simple. Uh, keep it something that you're able to reason yourself through to say you're capable of doing this. This is something you can do. Make sure that it is um, a goal that is easily attainable and that you're able to talk yourself into. Um, the next thing you really want to do is the next thing I did, which is you need to reach out. 
You really do. I know it can sound like a cliche, but you absolutely have to. Um, whether you're doing that in person or you're doing it online, whether it's friends, strangers, or calling a hotline, whatever it is, um, you need to just start talking. Um, even if you, like in this situation, even if you don't feel like you can handle being on the phone with somebody or directly interacting with them, go ahead, do what I just did. Just put a camera in front of you and start talking. And you can see, like I can see, there's, there's people here. There's people, I'm not alone. Um, because your depression will lie to you. That's the biggest thing I've learned about depression is it's a liar. It tells you that you are alone. It tells you that you're stupid. It tells you that you're just weak and that you're lazy and that it's all in your head. Your depression will lie to you. And it's important to know that those are lies, that your depression isn't right. Um, that's one of the things that can really get a person into serious trouble is when you don't know that, when you start believing those things about yourself, that you are worthless and that you're no good and that people are, are going to be mean to you or all kinds of different things that your depression will lie to you about to try to keep you isolated and, and keep you from moving. We have words on the screen. Uh, let's see. I would find somebody elderly to shop for. I have, and it takes your mind above things. Got to get her supplies, you know? Absolutely. Yes. Um, I, again, that's similarly what I find things that I can't motivate for myself. I can find that for somebody else and that can kind of get the ball rolling. Um, having people that depend on you and knowing that your actions matter. That goes into kind of a, a much deeper issue that I've been thinking a lot about lately is with, um, we have an epidemic in the U S of depression and anxiety. And there's been lots of studies and lots of hypotheses about what causes that. But I think it's tied up right with exactly what you just said. A lot of the things that we do in our modern world, in our daily lives, we don't get to see the direct effect of them. I think that it can make you feel like nobody needs you. It can make you feel like you're not doing anything important. You're thinking to yourself, oh, I'm just shuffling these papers at work, or I'm just scanning these groceries and it's not important. Um, you don't feel like you're helping. Humans are social animals. Even when you're an introvert, we need to feel like we're contributing to the collective, to the people in our community. Um, that's kind of been lost overall. And I think that's leading to a lot of this, uh, depression that we're seeing in people. We've lost a certain connection with each other, even as we gain all of this wonderful networking material and we can talk to people all over the world and we have all of this um, communication technology, yet people are feeling more alone than they've ever felt before. And I think that it is because um, they're not getting to see, do those direct actions. So yeah, one of the, the good things you can do and you can help yourself with is when your depression is really nasty, do something for somebody else. You'll often find that the things you can't do for you, you can do for somebody else. And then that starts you moving again. It starts you being able to see yourself in a positive light and have that motivation to do something positive for yourself as well. Um, so really, it's just about keeping momentum, um, because I think that if you lose momentum, I think that if at least this is what's true for me, I'll put it that way. I'll put it what's true for me because I can't speak for everybody else, um, speak for myself. If I lose my momentum, I get stuck. Um, if I just give in, if I just say, oh, well, you know what, today I'm not going to do anything. I'll do it tomorrow, but it never works like that. Um, I'll get locked in if I don't find, and it doesn't have to be huge accomplishments every day. I just have to keep getting up, keep doing showers, keep getting food. Uh, putting schedules together that let me keep mo moving. And I've discovered I've had several more minor bouts of depression throughout uh, the pandemic. Obviously, I think any, I think everybody at this point um, has, had, has had to experience that, especially being um, involved in reporting on it. Especially, God, those early days, um, there were some images and there were some things that we saw and experienced that I mean, it, it would cause psychological damage to anybody. 
Um, even the less graphic stuff, just watching people being welded into their homes, um, watching, just seeing the images of this, these busy streets empty, it leads to this feeling of isolation and it leads to this feeling of dread and doom. Um, and I think that people even who previously have never had problems with depression are probably experiencing, experiencing it now. And that's, you know, that's one of the things that I'm sitting there thinking to myself and racking my brain. Like, I know how to deal with the depression lie. You know what I mean? But it's a lot harder to form a plan when the situation is more universal, when it's more real. And I, I really think it's just about staying busy and choosing to stay busy in a way that positively impacts or potentially has the ability to impact a better future. I think a lot of people right now are very afraid. I think they're very angry. Um, looking at some of the protests, for example, I, at first, I was irritated. I was really irritated with some of the things I saw people saying, you know, I deserve to go get a haircut or I deserve to go to church. And I'm sitting there going, God, it's a pandemic. Just sit down and wait a few months. But I'm starting to wonder if that's just people's way of coping. If maybe that haircut or that act of going to church doesn't mean something bigger to them. Maybe, maybe it's not the actual haircut that they're saying they need. Maybe, maybe it's not just the act of, you know, because you can go to church online. And I was thinking about that and I was like, well, Okay, so your hair grows out. Mine's done. I'm having to hold it back. I've got a full mullet going on right now. I look like I'm out of the 80s. Um, and go to church online. But I, I, I think that at least some of those people, they're trying to communicate something that maybe we're not getting. And when I had that thought, it kind of made me change directions a little bit with some of my tactics. Um, because for me, my videos, my Twitter account, my website, it all has a single goal. It is to help individual people to be in a better position than the one that they ordinarily would have been in. I mean, take for example, the stories I just told you guys at the beginning of this video about what just happened. My husband wakes up sick, his job threatens to write him up for being sick and calling out sick. And the doctor didn't know the proper places to send him to test and the woman at the testing facility was incredibly condescending and nasty and basically refused to, to honor the doctor's order for the test. So obviously everybody's upset. Everybody, I lost track of my thoughts for a second. Please forgive me. One of my key features when I'm dealing with like really bad depression flare up, and I know a lot of other people have it, their brain kind of goes Neh, and you lose track. I have no idea what I was originally saying. Oh yes. Now I remember. Um, my whole focus has been on helping people to better themselves because quite frankly, I don't think it's an exaggeration or I don't think it's wrong to say that most of us feel like and are to a certain degree on our own here. Um, the authorities have been very, very slow to respond. They've been responding in ways that in some situations are making the situation worse. Um, so I recognize that pretty early. I mean, when I knew what I knew, when I understood the, just the basics of the virus, knowing that it could spread without symptoms, knowing that it had an unstable incubation, knowing that X amount of people had left the epicenter of the original outbreak and spread all over the world before the city had been locked down, I automatic, I knew, I mean, I'm a nobody that, I'm just a you know poor person that lives in rural Vermont in a crappy rundown trailer. If I knew, I was thinking to myself the whole time, I'm like, well, if I know the people in charge, they're smarter than me, they must know. Um, and I kept waiting. And a lot of the other people that I, you know, came to know in those early days, we all thought something was going to happen that didn't happen. We were expecting to see aggressive testing. We were expecting to see um, proper quarantining. We were expecting the policies to update with the information. For example, when we found out that 14 days was not adequate for quarantining someone exposed. Um, because we started seeing cases with people at day 20, day 28. There's one particularly uh, anomalous case that hit day 42 
that one is an outlier. We can't be 100% certain that that one wasn't an error. But we know for absolute fact that it, it hit 28 days several times. So we all kept expecting, oh, well, this information's just been released. So obviously the authorities are going to update the, the quarantine protocol. They never did. Then we learned that um, it was capable of infecting animals, for example, and myself even. I saw the original report from China, but the rest of the world's authorities completely, uh, they denied it so hard that even I was sitting there going, well, you know, maybe they were wrong. And people came to me and asked me about it. And I just told them, I was like, well, we don't have any evidence yet that that's true. Just keep your pets a little close just to be safe. Well, of course, just like everything else in this turns out, yeah, your pets can get infected. Mm, wonderful. And so it was a series of those events that led me and others to realize if we want to get out of this, if we want to come out of this any kind of intact, we're going to have to figure out how to do it ourselves. And there have been some absolutely beautiful cases of people stepping up to that challenge in this. Um, businesses that have completely just changed the way that they produce things. And they're now, you know, there's a pizza place in New York City. They're using their ovens to make face shields, medical face shields for doctors and nurses on the front line. Um, people that like you delivering food to elderly uh, members of the community. I mean, absolutely just beautiful examples of the best aspects of humanity. And I try really hard to kind of hold on to those because they are things that lift you up and they can make you feel a lot more optimistic. But at the same time, you can't ignore all of the problems. Um, it's a mess. Honestly, as far as like authorities go, protocols and the rest of it, we haven't made a lot of progress. I mean, lockdowns aren't supposed to be permanent. We have words on the screen. China was having people drop their pets from apartment buildings. People in the U.S. still deny their pets and carry. Yeah. So when they announced um, that definitely pets could be infected, I immediately got concerned because I watched that. Um, I saw that in China. Oh, there's some, there are a few images burned into my, behind my eyelids that I will probably see for the rest of my life. And some of the things that happened to the pets were one of them. I put out a series of tweets, just absolutely begging people and telling them, please don't hurt your animals. You don't have to get rid of them. Remember that if you keep them close to you, the only way they can get exposed is through you or through you getting yourself exposed. There's no reason to freak out and kill your pet or, or get rid of your pet. Um, just keep them close because, yeah, I saw all that and I, I still have a, a very big fear of when that information really saturates the population and people really start to get it. Um, that, yeah, you're pretty much every mammal is capable of getting it. And I've heard reports that apparently even some birds can, which that's a whole nother topic. Um, I've been really worried that, that we were going to start to see that here. Absolutely. So yeah, um, the authorities aren't doing a very good job. The media is not doing a good job. They're not telling people what they need to know and giving them simple, easy to follow, accurate instructions. I don't think that's a lot to ask for. So I decided, well, I may not be the most qualified, but I'll, I'll try using the things I do know, the things I am good at, and I'll put those out there and I'll try to help people. And I've been completely blown away at what I've been able to accomplish in a very short period of time. My website's had almost 200,000 visitors on it. I built, um, you know, uh, I think I'm at like 1400 followers on Twitter from zero. I had none when I started um, making videos again. I'm now over a hundred subscribers, just doing the basics, the things I'm good at, teaching people how to hatch chicks, um, sewing masks. I, <laughs> interestingly enough, I originally just, was sewing masks because of the mask shortage uh, for my husband and, and for other people I knew. Um, I had done the research myself early on as to what the best masks were back um, before we had really heavy industry. Um, what were we using that we found effective during the Spanish flu, which was uh, masks that were a silk outer layer and a cotton inner layer. So that's what I started making my masks as. Turns out uh, it was a good choice because Studies have just come out, they're finding out those particular masks, when it's made with really high quality silk and really high quality cotton, they can compete with N95s as long as you seal them on your face properly. Um, the silk rubs against the cotton, it 
creates a static electric charge that actually kind of zaps and repels the virus. I know that I'm butchering the science on that, but it's the easiest, it's the way I was able to understand it. Um, so once I realized that, hey, I have the ability to make masks that can compete with an N95, and I know that my husband's coworkers are, they handed out cloth, cloth masks at the psych hospital. The fabric is so cheap and so poor, you can look at it and see the holes. Like you're just looking straight through the cotton. That stuff has got to be like a hundred thread count or something. And I, I saw those and I was like, oh my Lord, no. So I started by just telling his coworkers, I was like, I'm not going to charge. I will ask for a donation to help fund my work. Um, and I started getting orders and I started making them. And then I ran out of material and I said, you know what? You're going to make a bunch of masks. So I just put in a big order, um, a bunch of silk bolt ends because you don't need much fabric to, to make a mask, obviously. So I'm getting this huge, almost a pound's worth of multicolored silk. I'm going to be able to make some really, really cool looking silk masks. Um, I ordered really high thread count of 100% cotton flannel sheets, actually, um, because I could get like six yards of fabric worth for about 60 bucks um, of that really high end cotton. So I was like, that's a lot cheaper. So I bought a sheet set in gray that's going to be coming in this week. So all of my flannel backings are going to be gray, and then I'll have multi multicolored silk on the front. Um, and again, that's that stuff keeps me motivated. It keeps me feeling like there's a point to things, um, reaching out and helping others in some way. So that's how I got into this, was for those exact same reasons. Why doesn't the CDC offer ways that we can boost our immune system, vitamin C, B, et cetera? Aiden Drago. Hi, Trinity. Just so that you guys know, uh, Aiden, that's my husband. He's in the other room. <laughs> He's been really great. He supports all of my work um, wholeheartedly. He watches every video I make and reads all my articles. So I love you very much. I love you. I really feel awful that you're sick. It's horrible. Um, so why doesn't the CDC offer ways we can boost our immune system? I don't know. I wrote an article called Reducing Our Risk because that wasn't being addressed. Oh, my hair's getting straight up there. Um, they should have been, one of the first things they should have done is, is put out something about risk factors and ways to minimize risk factors. They didn't. Uh, so I have an article on my website. Um, for those of you that are, that are viewing that maybe don't know it, uh, it's www.trinitysurvivor.com. Originally, the title was chosen... Um, I'm a survivor of domestic and sexual abuse. Um, but the name kind of took on a whole new meaning now that we're in a pandemic. So I, it works for that too. So that's why I use it. Um, so I've got an article about that basically saying now it's not the time to let your health go to hell. Uh, we need everybody making sure and understanding proper nutrition and making sure that whatever means they're using to get that nutrition, that they're meeting certain goals. So we need everybody taking multivitamins. We need everybody making sure they're getting enough calcium and zinc and magnesium. And because a lot of the vitamins and minerals, they are companion so that one won't absorb without the other. Um, so it's really important to make sure that you're getting the right amount of all of them. Uh, protein deficiency. I found out that the U.S. and even myself in my own life was not getting enough protein every day. Um, our diets can be really low on protein, um, especially with like the just quick grab it, microwave food, whatever that we tend to do when we're busy. Um, having a lack of protein is, it drastically lowers your immune system. Not having enough vitamin C, vitamin K, vitamin D, all of those go towards the system being able to repair cell damage, uh, increase your white blood cell counts properly, get your immune system functioning. So yeah, um, that should have been done. Um, there should have been a big thing about nutrition put out to get everybody on a healthier diet to tell, put out something even for specifically what I've tried to do, uh, people that have low income. I'm one of them, um, dirt poor. And it can be really, really hard. We can't afford all of the fruits and fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, we just can't. So if we've noticed that the um, poor community and the, um, the minority communities are getting hit some of the hardest, and it makes sense. They can't afford the better diet. They can't afford to keep up with their health care properly, um, especially what they call the working poor, where you make too much to get Medicaid, but not enough to pay for your insurance and your co-pays. 
my family, we're in one of those situations. Um, so your health suffers for it um, because you can't get the right foods, you can't get the right medicine, and now is not the time to let our health slip. Any symptoms you have, you need to be getting on calling your primary care provider and addressing it. You got to manage to keep taking your medications, talk to your doctor about what to do for shortages, figure out a way to get a buffer system. Uh, those instructions should have been put out. Um, the vitamins and where to get them if you can't afford or can't get access to the fruits and vegetables, you know, what's the best type of vitamin C, D, K, whatever, to get into your system, that should have all been covered by the CDC. You're absolutely right. I don't have any answers as far as why many of the odd, obvious things haven't been done. I don't know. Um, some people believe that it's on purpose. Some people think that it's just, that's how stupid everybody's gotten. Some people think it's because of funding cuts. I personally believe it's a little of column A, B, and C. I think that we're seeing a perfect storm situation between actual greed and some maliciousness in some cases um, of the fact that we've lost a lot of our respect for um, medical science and nutritional science and just plain and simple stupid laziness. I, I think it's all kind of come together. So I think I don't think anybody's wrong when they talk about the cause of why they think that these things aren't happening. I think it's a little bit of everything, depending on what the topic is. I see more words on the screen. <laughs> My husband. I know you follow Dr. Dina Grayson. I find that her posts are too politically charged to follow. I think she's pushing people that need information. Yes, she is. Absolutely. Um, I, I do follow her. It does not... I don't do political. Um, you'll very rarely hear me make a comment that could even be considered political. Now, I will go after anybody saying anything blatantly dangerous or stupid. I don't care if Democrat, Republican, actor, actress, public figure, private citizen. Every, anybody that's been following me long enough knows that I can get really passionate about this, as I feel we all should be. Um, these are people's lives at stake. So I can get very, very, very... Um, charged <laughs> with my stuff, but I've been very careful. I've tried to be very careful not to bring politics into anything that I do because it pushes people away. Um, that's been a huge fear of mine. Um, obviously, you can't please everybody all of the time. Um, there's been one or two uh, people that I eventually just had to block. They wanted me to get political um, or they were ascribing political motives to certain things I did, which quite frankly had no bearing on it and it was an ongoing problem but for the most part my followers are from all all ends of the spectrum of politics and we used to all be like that i mean remember back in the days when you had friends and you didn't even know who they voted for nor did you care i mean we used to be like that um and i one of the advantages of, of the life i've led is i guess i've been pretty isolated so uh, a lot of the um political uh ideology infection that's happened, I wound up being sort of a little bit immune to um, because I just wasn't exposed to it. I haven't had TV for years and years and years. I spent a lot of my time with my nose in a book. Um, I tend to not judge things based on who says it, but on the merit of the topic itself. So I have had followers in the past be a little confused. Um, for example, say I share something from Dina. Doesn't mean that I endorse her political ideas. Um, I do not share her stuff that I feel is in and of itself. That particular statement is politically charged. I try to be careful with it, but I will share information from any source, no matter who it is, if that particular piece of information has merit and has something to back it up. So that's the way I try to balance the whole thing, but I completely agree with you. Um, she can be very, very political. It definitely pushes people away, um, which is why I really try not to do that. they lost uh, respect for medical science because all the woo doctors tell them things that they want to hear instead of what they need to hear yeah so there has been um really i mean it's been going on for decades but i think really uh heavily seen in the last 20 years this further and further separation between um what would be common sense uh quote unquote non-medical for example nutrition right um there's a lot of people that are being considered quote unquote woo peddlers that really aren't. 
they should be included in medicine, medical science and art. Then you get the flip side of that. We're having individuals that are completely non-based in science at all, and they'll portray themselves like they're actually science-based medicine. Um, it's been very confusing for people to try to separate that. There was actually a recent incident that I, I saw of it. This person, they were sitting in what appeared to be a doctor's office. They were wearing uh, like a doctor's coat with a name tag on it. They called themselves a doctor um, and they told people <laughs> to drink tonic water because there is minute traces of um, quinine in it. And they were really pushing the, uh, the chloroquine stuff. And they were doing it in a very unsafe way. And it set my bells off. I'm going, Hippocratic oath is first do no harm. Um, I have an autoimmune disorder. It's genetic. Um, my mother has it as well. I've never been on chloroquine specifically or my mother, but um, we've been on many other different drugs from steroids to immunosuppressants, you name it. Those things have serious side effects. They're not something that you take lightly. They're not something that you would want to just throw out as a panacea because there's some serious trouble you can get into. So I saw this guy doing exactly that, really being nonchalant about it. And I was like, hmm, doctor. Well, I dug. Found out the guy's not a medical doctor. He's a chiropractor. Um, now, there's two kinds of chiropractors. There's the kind of chiropractor who fixes your back. Fine. There's another kind of chiropractor out there that goes off into the pseudoscience direction. And they basically believe that you can cure cancer by manipulating vertebrae in your spine. It doesn't work. I mean, we, we, we know that doesn't work. Unfortunately, they will present themselves like they are real medical doctors. And what that does is, say, for example, you have somebody who believes them and it doesn't work. Well, now they don't trust doctors at all. Or you have somebody, and this happens to a lot of people chronically ill, we have problems with our medical establishment. They're not treating the whole person like they should. Um, the system is really messed up. The pharmaceutical industry runs medicine now. I hate to sound like one of the conspiracy theorists, but it's true. It's just a fact. They take very inexpensive to make life-saving medicines like insulin, for example, and they it costs them a couple dollars to make, but they will charge hundreds and hundreds of dollars a month for a person's supply. So a person who's been run through the medical ringer, which I have and several, several of my followers have, you do gain a distrust. And some of these snake oil people, they're right there to swoop in and capitalize on that. So we, I think we have a lot of confused people and I think that it makes sense that we have a lot of confused people. Correct you for I think there should be fines for people that impersonate a doctor. Oh, absolutely. Um, informed consent. I see nothing wrong with people choosing to go to um, somebody that practices herbalism or some sort of spiritual healing, as long as there's informed consent. My problem comes in when these individuals start um, giving the impression that they are something that they're not, that they've gone through medical school when they haven't, or that they make claims that are objectively untrue and that they know they're untrue, but they're doing it anyway. Basically, well, I mean, take, for example, this pandemic situation. The medical system is screwed. I don't think anybody can argue with that when you're looking at the situation that we're currently in. I mean, they haven't got a clue. They don't know what they're doing. People are confused, and rightly so. You turn on one news channel, they'll tell you one thing. You turn on the other, and with just as much conviction, they'll tell you something else. And then, like this, doing the right things, following the proper protocol. Husband gets sick, calls out of work, immediately calls the doctor, doing all the right things, right? And look what happened. They're looking at writing him up, and the testing facility itself called and bitched him out and told him that they won't take him, they won't take the doctor's order for his testing there. Yeah, I think people are pissed off, and I think they're confused, and I think they don't know who to listen to, and I get that. Um, I spend up to 16 hours a day researching and cross-checking, and I'm confused. 
you know? Like I've had the time um, because I'm immunocompromised. I was an Uber driver before all this. I stopped very quickly. Um, so I had time on my hands to put into to following the stories and to, you know, chasing down different leads here and there. And it very quickly turned into a he, sh he said, she said kind of situation. Um, it's confusing for me. And I put, you know, 12 hours a day into it. You take somebody that is having to work or they've got small kids and they're having to figure out how to homeschool them during all the lockdowns and all of this. They need to have a place where they can quickly get quick access to accurate, concise information. And we don't have that. Um, so, yeah, honestly, I think we need to go further than just finding people for impersonating um, medical providers when they're not. I think we should go back to the old days where, you know, uh, journalists, if they gave false information, they got fired. We used to do that. You go back to the days of Walter Cronkite and even, you know, Dan Rather. It was called journalistic integrity. You weren't allowed to put dangerous spin on things. And we can talk about, you know, old forms of propaganda all, all we want. Yes, they've always existed. However, I think everybody can agree that where we are today with media and where we were 50 years ago are two very different places. Um, and it happened when we went to 24-hour news network because now they have to keep your interest. It's about watch minutes. They need to keep people watching 24 hours a day so they'll make up news if they have to to do it. They will take one piece of information, an objective incident that happened or an objective fact, and they will twist it this way and that way and to fill up that time slot without any regard for those of us sitting here watching who are relying on this information in, in the pandemic for our very lives. I sent messages back in mid-February, I believe it was, both to, <laughs> difficult me, World Health Organization, all the media networks, I doubt that they cared, but it made me feel better, and told them all, if you've got blood on your hands, every last one of you, the, the deaths that are about to happen, don't say nobody told you that they were coming. I'm telling you. I know that if I'm telling you and I'm a nobody, there are other people that are actually in, you know, actual doctors, actual scientists that can see what I see. You know, the blood is on your hands at this point. You've been warned. Um, but they continued and they continue today. They should be the ones explaining to you, for example, the masks, how to make them the most effective to say, hey, these are the materials, this is the best pattern, everybody go out and do it. They should be the ones talking about nutrition. They should be sitting there saying, hey, these are the vitamins and minerals that uh, most American diets are deficient in. Here's the ones that you need. Here are different ways you can get them into your diet. Go on, go out. Um, as far as how long people should be quarantined, you know, hey, it's got an unstable incubation. You may need to be quarantined for up to 28 days. Here's this information. Here's the proof. Here's the studies about it. Go on with your day. So I think on top of the very real tragic situation of the deaths and the sickness and the suffering and the broken supply chains and the loss of jobs, to tie that all back into the problem of depression inside these lockdowns and pandemics, people are feeling really hopeless. Um, they're feeling really defeated, I think. And that inevitably leads to some people handling that in an aggressive way. Um, we just had a story come out. This person, there was a, a clerk at a, a store. I don't know if it was a convenience store. I'm not sure. Store, um, they were just doing their job. They were telling people you can't come into the store because it's an enclosed place without a mask on. The virus is airborne, by the way. Definitely airborne. Um, this person lost their temper, they left, they came back with a gun, and they shot that person dead. I'm not by any stretch of the imagination excusing that person, by the way, or any violence of any kind. It is never acceptable. I don't care the situation. However, when we're speaking of cause and effect and how to reduce these instances in the future, you can't be blind to the things that caused them. The confusion, the frustration, the, the feeling of being alone in this mess, the feeling that, you know, almost like it's an us versus them situation, feeling sometimes, and I've felt it, feeling like these authorities must be doing this on purpose. They're trying to kill me, you know? 
you can see how an ordinarily rational individual could get that far off track. Um, and we are on our own here. So we're going to have to figure out how to deal with all of these mental health implications that on top of everything else, on top of trying to, <clears throat> excuse me, stay uninfected, on top of trying to figure out money, on top of everything else, we have another thing now that we have to keep in mind, and that is mental health. A few words. Uh, if I had no moral compass, it would make me want to keep my mouth shut and just go in any way because these people make you feel like you can't win and feel like it's not worth the trouble. Thankfully, I do have a moral compass, but how many people out there don't? How many will see that they'll meet resistance and say it's just not worth the hassle and spread this thing? That is a very good point. And I, I don't, I think that it can go, some people, it may be a lack of a moral compass, but I think some people may just be frightened desperate. Um, regardless of the cause, though, absolutely, that is happening. We know it's happening, especially in the jobs, the essential jobs that we pay people dirt and treat them like dirt for. Store clerks, uh, lower tier medical workers, um, all different places. I mean, come on, we all know how you get treated now. The idea that we can stay home from work when we're sick in any time is a joke. If you're not dead, you get your ass up and you go into work. And if you don't, they'll fire you and find somebody that will. You add the rest of the pressures into this. It makes sense that a person might just rationalize in their own head if they're not that sick saying, oh, it's not actually the virus. It's probably just allergies. Maybe it's just a cold. It's not that big deal. You know, rationalize the situation and go into work anyway because the idea of losing your job is something that, you know, especially when you don't have money, you're sitting there thinking, God, I can't do that. Or just in the case of resistance, not everybody's great with confrontation. I'm one of them. Um, I'm not happy to have to admit that it can sometimes be easy to push me around. Um, this situation has done a lot to give me more confidence and teach me how to handle confrontation better. But due to my history of abuse and just things that I don't want to get into, um, I learned to be kind of submissive um, in the face of aggression in some places. And I think a lot of us have learned that, especially if you've been, quote unquote, on the bottom for most of your life. Um, you get used to it. You get numb to it. And you just start learning to take the path of least resistance. Again, tying that right back into depression and mental health, I think that in the years to come, even after the pandemic's over, we're going to continue to see some very serious mental health effects. There's going to be people who are good people who look back on the situation and some choices they made, maybe made that, you know, objectively weren't the right choice going into work sick and it turns out they were actually infected or whatever. Um, they're going to feel very responsible for a lot of, uh, a lot of the situation. They're going to look at things and may not always feel like they can live with those quote unquote mistakes. Um, I worry about that a lot. I, I do try to tell people, you know, it's not do it for yourself for multiple reasons, wear your mask, use the hand, you know, use the spraying alcohol, do everything you can to keep from catching or spreading this virus. Yes, because of the public health. Absolutely. Yes, for care of your own life. Absolutely. But there is a mental health aspect to that as well. Everybody at the end of the day has to be able to live with themselves. You have to be able to sleep at night. You have to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and be proud of the person you are. And when you can't do that, um, especially if you mix in previous mental health disorders like depression, like uh, bipolar, I mean, anything, any mental health condition, and then you add that in, that feeling of guilt, which there will be a lot of in the years to come, um, it's definitely a concern and it's something that I'm already thinking about and trying to kind of warn people about and say, hey, mental health is just like physical health. It's better to treat something early or to completely avoid it to begin with than it is to let it get bad and try to deal with it then. Um, so just like our physical health, our mental health is like that. Um, we need to really be aware of it and extremely aware of it now. Like I said, because 
we are people are dying i mean i'm i'm not going to use any euphemisms or try to make it sound any better than it is people are dead families are grieving uh death from this virus is not an easy death i've um had especially in the early days uh specifically from iran a lot of people that i had contact with um, that did wind up getting infected and dying um one in particular it wound up going viral but it was also sent to me personally a younger girl i mean she wasn't little little but she was in her teen years um and it was a video of what it was like to die from this without treatment it it's not a good death it really is not a good death and the implications of seeing these things and as the infection spreads and as more and more systems stop functioning properly we're all going to see some things um, either peripherally or directly with our own two eyes it'll even be some of our loved ones people we care about we're going to see things that will stay with us for the rest of our lives so it's very important that we take care of our mental health as the situation goes on as we notice things start slipping. If, if you notice a gear starting to slip a little, you have to address it immediately um, because we can't afford right now to just let it go. We have too much riding on our ability to make good decisions. Um, and in the future, part of our future depends on being able to live with the decisions we've made. And it's really important. Oh, no, that was still the same thing you wrote. But yeah, to be honest, and just to address the aspect of the moral compass, I think that your average working class citizen, I don't think that they're necessarily malicious in when they make mistakes. However, there are individuals that we can objectively look at and say, this person does not have a proper moral compass. When you look at the pharmaceutical executives talking about how they have no intention of making sure to make any treatments or vaccines sound affordable, um, which, I mean, that's, that's the definition of evil right there. <laughs> that's evil. Um, when you look at the media, corporations, they've got to know what I know. They've got to know what you know. I mean, it's their job to have all this. They, they, they traffic in information, okay? They know. They are choosing to not help. They are choosing to instead create more money for themselves, create a big drama show to make a big circus out of it. You know, the more blood that's in the streets, the better for the media. Um, those people are, that's malicious. Corporations that, the big ones that are refusing, just flat out refusing to acknowledge the problem with uh, offshoring all of our production. If they had a moral compass, they take a little bit of a financial hit and they would have in this time between, you know, realizing we had shortages and where we are right now, they would have come back. They'd have said, Hey, we'll spend a little money now to have prosperity later. We will bring jobs back. A lot of people lost jobs in industries that quite frankly, we just can't afford in a pandemic. No problem. We'll get those jobs taken care of. We'll bring them back and we'll fix the, the shortage problem too. Win-win, right? <clears throat> only that isn't happening you see it in small businesses you see it in individuals but when it comes to these bigger corporations um no no moral compass there whatsoever they do not care if we live or die at all as long as they keep making money um again that's depressing as hell <laughs> uh you know, I'm, I'm surprised I haven't had more of a problem with my depressive disorder. <laughs> my legs. <clears throat> um, let me fix that. There we go. I'm surprised that I haven't had more of a problem. Um, I'm really disappointed in my countrymen. And I don't mean, you know, you guys that I'm talking to specifically, and I, I don't even mean... Um, you know, your average person that is lost and confused and doesn't know what to do and is angry. I mean, in our system itself, we have traded 
our value for life for a value for money. And this situation has made that abundantly clear that this country doesn't run on health and what's best for us. It runs strictly on cold, hard cash. But that is a problem with unregulated capitalism. Um, when you treat corporations like they're people, which we do, it's written into our laws, um, you wind up with this. You wind up with this situation where those corporations that have offshored all of their production, they basically are, it's basically slave labor, let's be honest, let's not kid ourselves. The reason that we're able to buy, have been able to buy so many goods so cheaply is because people are being paid pennies on the dollar for brutal work. And the corporations don't want to give that up, even when now it's obvious that, like, just forget about how wrong that is anyway. Take a look at just what's happening in our country. We, our doctors and nurses and uh, health technicians are getting sick and dying. Um, we have healthcare workers, my husband included, working in cloth masks that their family members have to make for them. We have medication shortages. We've got food rotting in fields because of a breakdown in supply chain that could have been donated. They didn't have to leave it there to rot. People are going hungry. They could have donated that to the food shelf shelf. They could have donated it to the homeless community, but they didn't. They'd rather let it rot than see it go to the people that need it most. And that's depressing as hell. That's depressing as hell to watch. Um, my depressive disorder aside, it is depressing and has been depressing. And I have to, every single day, make sure to balance all, seeing all of that information with making sure to seek out positive information to try and keep that balance so you don't get this idea that everybody's bad and everything's horrible. It is stories like those, that pizza place that gave up making pizza to make uh, visors. It's seeking out, well, like the story you just told me there about, you know, you bringing, just doing grocery shopping for an elderly person. Um, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of stories like that every day that come out. They don't put them on the front page, but they're there. And I think it's really important for our mental health to seek those out, to keep a balance, an idea that, yeah, there's a lot wrong, but there's still a lot right. We have to remember not to just look at the worst humanity has to offer. We have to look at the best that they're offering too. Got to run. Keep us updated. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much for um, what you're doing to help, uh, you know, other people. Keep it up. It's amazing. Thank you. We all, I think, could do with a little charity work in these days. Um, even if you can't go out, even if it's not safe to, everybody has skills that they've acquired over the course of, their, course of their life. Everybody, whether you know it or not, you have something special about you that is unique. And if you can find that and find what you can offer others because of that unique trait, it lifts you up tremendously. Um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, direct linear thinking to this, like, okay, you know, say you don't have a sewing machine, you don't know how to sew. Okay, so you can't directly make masks, or, you know, you're autoimmune compromised, so you can't go out, necessarily, it's not safe for you to go out and uh, do charity in the community directly. But maybe you're really good at, I don't know, maybe you have a really good skill with carpentry right? Well, that's something you can give. Not a lot of people have that skill anymore. A lot of us, because it's not safe to have people coming into our homes to do repairs. Um, I know us, we have been really grateful for the YouTube, uh, people who make YouTube videos about doing home improvement, about carpentry. Um, it could literally save our lives at some point, especially next winter. This place is literally, I mean, if anybody came in, it's bloody condemnable. We're trying to fix it, but we don't know what we're doing. So if you have that skill 
and you offer that, if you put that out there to the world, you're making a huge difference to somebody that doesn't have that skill. Say you are really good with sewing. You can make videos, teach people how to sew. In my case, I know how to hatch chicks. So I show people how to hatch chicks. It doesn't have to be something that is obvious. It doesn't have to be something directly related to medicine or directly related to, um, you know, taking care of people in need in a immediate way. There's all kinds of things, little things, big things, you name it, that you can do. Each and every one of us has a gift. Each and every one of us has something special inside of us. Um, and by finding it and nurturing it and putting it out there, bringing it out into the world and letting it help and change the lives of other people, I personally feel that that is the absolute best medicine you can get uh, to treat your depression, um, regardless of what the cause of that depression is. So take care of yourselves, make time for yourselves. Yes, um, all the cliches are true. If you're in trouble, say something, find somebody to talk to. If you're having thoughts of self-harm, um, you need to call the, uh, you need to call the suicide tip line, which I, or helpline. I'll actually, when I post this as a video itself, I'll put that number in the description of this for people. Um, I'll look it up and I'll put it in there. If you're having trouble getting out of bed every day, make tiny little easily achievable goals that get you moving. Just get, say, I'm going to get up and just brush my teeth. And then you take it from there. Just go one step at a time. But once you have that under control, one of the keys to maintaining mental health in a situation like this is to find that thing that makes you special, that makes you absolutely unique and amazing, and turning that into something that can benefit everybody else. I really genuinely believe, I genuinely believe this, that we don't need the government or the authorities to save us. I a hundred percent believe that. I believe that just as it's always been, the people themselves have all the power. We can do this. We can. It may be a little harder for us because we don't have the platform and we don't have the reach, but we can do this. We just have to get everybody together and have them put that piece of special in them out for the rest of the world to see. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't still be here. I wouldn't be reporting in the news and writing in my online journals and making these videos and sewing these masks and doing all of these things if I thought it was doomed. I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. I believe we can make a difference. I believe that we can create a better world for ourselves, for our children, and for the generations that come after us. I believe that there is hope. And I think that is the most important thing we can give to each other in this situation. It's not hopeless. We're not powerless. We can do this. All right. Live stream's been going on over an hour, so it's time to sign off. Let me read the last comments here. It'll be pretty yet, miss. Thank you, Trinity. I'll see you on Twitter. Keep posting the truth. I've followed you from the start. Thank you, and thank you for being there. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you for helping in this situation. All right. I love everybody. Bye-bye. See you next time.